Hey folks, uh, greetings and welcome along to the podcast. Today we're sitting down for uh, a bit of a chat over video with Rod Drury. Rod, how are you today? Hey Paul, nice to actually see a human. How you doing? <laughs> good, good, good. Um, hey, it's it's we haven't really caught up too much in uh, in recent times, and you've been a, a little bit out of the uh, the spotlight. Um, you know, since handing over the reins at, at zero, but of course you're on the board there, and um, you're always doing you know lots lots of things behind the scenes. I think uh, last time I bumped into you uh, was at the Electrifying uh, Conversations uh, event in in Auckland uh, on sustainability and uh, electric vehicles. Well, what have you been up to? Maybe you just, just fill people in a, a little bit. Oh, it's been really fun being out of the spotlight. Actually, I've been. Um... I've been mountain biking quite a lot. That's sort of been the thing. You know, I think, you know, when you're trying not to work, having something you can sort of achieve goals every day has been great. So I've been doing heaps of that. Um, and uh, obviously the board of Zero is pretty busy. So lots of good things there. And that's really it. Just a few little startups I've been playing with, but really don't want to do too much work. Kind of my theory was, you know, with Zero, it, it was for, you know, 10, 12 plus years, a 24 by 7 business. And, you know, it just didn't stop. So I kind of figured I kind of um, uh, crushed my career into a shorter time period. And then when you finish, you don't want to go back and do some more work. So I've been really enjoying just having a break, um, doing uh, some high quality things, spending time with the kids finally, um, and then really thinking about a lot of the big projects that, 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 that I think create platforms for uh, New Zealand to be even more awesome. So yeah, I was quite uh, reluctant to step back into the spotlight. I don't know how long I'll do it for. I uh, certainly have no interest in, in, in sort of being out there um, other than driving good change for uh, New Zealand. And, you know, it was pretty inspiring seeing the likes of the Sam Morgan, Stephen Tindall's, the Mowbray's, um, uh, Rob Fife, how they really got things kicked off with this COVID crisis. And uh, and Sam basically pressured me and said, right, you've got to get back out there. So so I'll have a little spurt and, uh, you know, got some ideas I've been working on for the last last few years, which I think are quite relevant to what we're doing now. And then hopefully let, I'll let others take the public public face in a few months once we kind of know what we're doing. Yeah, OK. Well, look, I'm um, I'm I'm very keen because you have a, um, you know, incredible view over um, over small business, of course, and and, you know, incredible insights into building, you know, really successful global um, company out of new out of New Zealand and look at you know at this time we're you know we're still you know really right in the middle um, of the lockdown and and uh, and the crisis there's there's so much that's unknown in terms of what will be the impact uh, you know for uh, New Zealand for the world for the economy um, but I think it's really important that we we be looking ahead and not you know not just completely focused on the on the here and now and the panic around you know how we feed ourselves and so on but um and and how we pay the immediate bills but that we're we're being as strategic as we can through the through this time um so that that's like yeah you know, i guess was you know very keen to hear from you um and you you, you published something in the last uh in the last few days and 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 shared some of your own um thoughts and and things that i think um you know maybe you've you've already been d discussing with uh, with some of your um i guess some of your your peers in terms of business leaders that you've already um, already mentioned can you walk us through really um you know what what that thinking is what are the things that are um that are that are top of mind uh for you in terms of the approaches that um that we can be taking right now to um you know to to really achieve that uh longer term success and to you know i guess it, it it it's sort of strange strange to say it when you know we're in a world where a lot of people are dying but um you know to get the best out of um you know what is a, an incredibly far from ideal um you know scenario for the world right now yeah absolutely and um you know i think like when you're in business you're always balancing what you have to do um uh, right now you know what your customers are asking for uh, what changes have to be made so you just have to do it you don't have a choice and then you're also trying to think about how do you move towards your strategy and you're also trying to make sure that you have the right amount of resources into making sure you keep nudging towards your long-term goals as well so this this crisis is exactly that right there's there are people that are in, in an incredibly scary place I mean you look at 
um, some of the business, the business owners, some of our customers in the US, their businesses have just stopped, and most businesses, you know, don't don't have um, many weeks, if any weeks, of cash. The US government's put out um, uh, their PPP, is it payroll protection program or something like that, and you physically can't get through on the website or on the phone call to get your money. So, like, there's people who may not be able to put food on the table for their children over the next, you know, in the next few weeks to a month. So, while it's great to think about the big things, which we'll talk about today, like, you know, we're all feeling really bad for the short-term things which are happening right now. And, um, you know, we're, you know, it's interesting seeing some of the tech companies really step up globally to do what some of the banks you would expect to do, what other the government would do because you can just do things faster and uh, we haven't got to that point in uh, New Zealand yet because our systems are holding well but even in New Zealand you know we're seeing people very very scared but uh, man I'm glad we're here and not somewhere else so so probably the, the best thing I've seen um, to think about the the crisis is the framework uh, that Roger Dennis put up and I've known Roger for quite a few years and he um, put together a, well, he did some work on uh, pandemic, uh, pandemics about three years ago. So he, he 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 really did hit the ground running, and he came up with um, the three wave model. So the first wave, what are the things you need to do right now to how to keep people alive, and and again the Sams, the Stevens, the Nicks, uh, Rob Fife, and all that got together with on, on all those problems. So you know, can we make uh, some ventilators here? Can we source PPE? Uh, we worked out that ventilators need oxygen had to solve that problem and now we're working on how do you do lots of testing and all of those sort of things there's a bunch of work that's happening in that wave one wave two is um, how do we uh, keep everybody working and uh, what, what can we do right now what are the projects we can do that get people into work and then wave three are those um, really exciting kind of uh, nation building projects so what I'm kind of focused on this week you know I know that the wave one stuff's going quite well is is what are the wave two projects and the sort of things that we've talked about there are things that um, that that um, uh, are problems that we've been discussing for years. And what's kind of interesting about this crisis is, you know, you may sort of be patient and wait ten years for change. I think a lot of change will happen in, in the next two years, and it forces us to have a very crisp discussion around the things we can do. So, so there's a few obvious uh, uh, tech things. Um, so one of the discussions we've had over the last year or so, which hasn't really bubbled through, is after the great work we did with UFB, where we essentially broke the chicken and egg and got fibre laid, laid out to the home, uh, and then uh, any retail ISP could provide services over the top, and now we have so much better internet than Australia, even better internet than um, uh, the US. Why wouldn't we do the same uh, with 5G? You know, we're a small... Uh, skinny country, we need lots of towers, we don't have a lot of population. Um, so uh, so instead of having, you know, two or three network providers build, off, build up a whole lot of towers, and I'm sure they're doing lots of sharing and, and all that as well, but, but that sort of long-term infrastructure investment is quite different from running a publicly traded company that does lots of marketing and those things. So um, as I've been working with the Aussie Super Funds over the last two or three years, they have a really interesting problem. The, the Aussie Super, Aussie Super, because they've had compulsory savings, has two trillion dollars of of funds to invest, and what they'll do is they'll give that out to fund managers who you know kind of have to invest in Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Apple, Alibaba, companies that don't pay domestic tax, but also are creating short term and and medium and long term job issues. So the Aussie super funds have been dying to get um, big projects so they can spend. They want to write five to ten billion dollar checks. So infrastructure is perfect. And what's neat is that the government doesn't have to pay for these things. We just need to be clever and get the financial architecture right so that uh, uh, those big super funds who want to place money, they can get three percent, five percent these days on big safe infrastructure projects. And these are largely fixed cost uh, projects and then you pay then as people start connecting to the services then they pay so so 5g feels like an awesome opportunity we already know that it's worked uh, for ufb so we want to spend you know two to three billion dollars worth of um of of um of fiber and tower infrastructure you know we go, can go and get that from the aussie and new zealand super funds and they can roll it out and then we put a per connection charge there's two million mobile connections 
you know, f five bucks a month goes to your mobile infrastructure, maybe it's 10 bucks a month. Um, and then you can see how you start funding that um, infrastructure and then any um, it, then any sort of ISP or, or mobile ISP can provide services over the top, creates a whole lot of new opportunities and those sort of things. So we've talked about that, Chris Far four years on point. So what I've been doing is just directly asking the question is, Chris, can we do this or not? We don't have to wait months. If you, this all makes sense, you've thought about it before, make a decision now. The other really big one um, is PayWave. I mean, we've pissed around on that for years and years and years, right? With four different commerce ministers over 10 years, we've talked about the, the uh, domestic debit network and the uh, domestic uh, credit network. And that just requires uh, some leadership. Maybe we've got to put a small charge on FPOS to balance that network up. But, you know, we've already seen it work at work, work in um, Australia. When I used to go to go to Aussie, you know, you, then I, I never pulled my credit card out of my pocket. And we just look crazy when a small business owner has a sitting there with no pay wave on their, on their device. But what's happened now is nobody wants to touch the terminal. So there's never been a better time to deal with the pay wave issue. So, again, that's on Chris Far Farfoy's portfolio. He knows all about it. Um, the last four commerce ministers have done all the work, so they they need to show some courage, get all the banks in a room, and, and lay out how it's going to be. So again, this is as pressure time. We can't wait. We need to move. And I think the really big one. And sorry, you go, Paul. Oh uh, yeah. So with, with that one, what what um, what do you see as the challenge? What are you hearing as the challenge? Because um, Australia, I guess it's it's sort of understandable why um, why they moved to that sort of tap to pay type model because they didn't have the success um, of a you know FPOS model as we had in New Zealand, which of course has been you know very low cost, incredibly successful. It, it sort of really uh, led the world, but because of the the great success of that, moving to a tap to pay type model. Um, which comes with, at this stage, with higher costs, um, you know, we, we haven't been able to move forward. So um, is there a way to bring down those, those costs of the, um, you know, the contactless type um, payments? Or do you think it is a matter of sort of in increasing the costs of FPOS to really uh, to make that viable? Yeah, well, it's quite a complex thing. We can talk about that for an hour, but, but, but just a very <laughs> high level of it is... Um, because we have because we have an FPOS model which is which is really cheap. So, you know, a store owner pays thirty to fifty bucks a month for that mobile uh, connection and has no transaction fees. So the a domestic debit network works really really well. Um, but the but the banks don't make any money out of it. If they um, if they uh, go through PayWave, which is the uh, domestic credit network. The um, those little FPOS devices have both networks on, on um, that 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 flow through them, and what's what's happened is that Visa and Mastercard, and there is a place uh, for credit. It's convenient; you should pay for that. But Visa and Mastercard obviously clip the ticket and they share that with the banks, so the banks then get a transaction fee. So the economic incentives are for the banks to allow that as um, uh, to allow that fee to be charged because they can clip the ticket. So to get the economic incentives right, we need to probably, you know, maybe there's a per dip charge of, of a few cents per transaction, but we can also regulate the interchange rate and the right people should pay for credit. If you're paying, uh, it shouldn't be the merchant because what happens if you're sitting there um, in a corner dairy and somebody walks up and wants to tap, that's a 3% charge that the merchant pays, which is inflation across all small businesses. So we need to make it so that the right people pay for the for the ability to use credit. And we need to obviously, um, you know, be able to have contactless um, uh, domestic debit so that the money changes hands. So effectively what's happening is our great FPOS network uh, the transaction volume on that will will fall, and more transactions goes into goes into these overseas credit networks. So the money moves offshore, and a merchant doesn't even have confidence for like four or five weeks that they're actually going to get the money because that can be pulled back. So so the the work's all been done with that. It's been done three or four times. Um, it just needs now for the commerce minister to get everyone in the room, threaten the banks uh, to regulate and do the right thing. And get make sure the economic incentives are right, and that might might be a small a small per dip fee of five to ten cents. But remember, moving money is moving bits of data. There is no cost in moving money. You know that should co cost fractions of a cent. 
But I think, you know, we'd be happy if we can pay, you know, five cents a transaction or whatever so that, you know, we can use um, a domestic debit in a contactless way. The other interesting thing is the battle that's going on between Apple and the Australian banks. So Apple won't allow the secure enclave and they won't allow apps that allow the phone to be um, to have that kind of uh, security key. And so then you run into the problem of even if you built a kind of triangulation type architecture, you know, we might scan a QR code or something, whatever it is, that sort of beacon, which allows you to connect the merchant with the person that's buying them, buying the money. Um, uh, both Apple and Google make that very, very hard. And it's so interesting watching the fight play out with the um, Australian banks as as mobile carriers and Apple and Google trying to get into that transaction. So there's all of that to untangle as well. Yeah, look, I, I mean, I think um, that it's certainly something pretty interesting to watch, but it, the, these are genuine challenges that, um, that, that need to be addressed. And, you know, I guess... Um, you know, sometimes it, it requires government to, uh, you know, to, to step in and, and take a level of uh, control. Um, I mean, it's really interesting and, you know, to me, you know, it's somewhat worrying just, just the way um, that the, the biggest global tech companies keep growing and growing uh, and how much that sort of squashes the local players. You know, in New Zealand yesterday, uh, you know, we heard from, uh, the local, uh, you know, the lo the local media companies that are, you know, already under incredible uh, pressure, uh, you know, prior to uh, to, to COVID nineteen, um, from the the likes of uh, Facebook and and, and so on, um, and then you know the, the, they're sharing around their frustration with uh, you know government spending all these advertising dollars are just you know flowing straight out the door um, and back to Silicon Valley uh, and and not supporting. Uh, the the local sort of media entities here to uh, to to the same degree, and look, I think you know there there, there are so many challenges associated with that, and yeah, the the idea of uh, you know I guess Apple being able to um, you know clip the ticket or you know to a you know to a reasonably large degree on transactions uh, through uh, an iPhone or an a an Apple Watch and not allowing other players to compete there is you know is certainly something that that's un unhelpful. Um, to keeping a balance to things globally. So, yeah, definitely in, in agreement with those thoughts there, Rod. Um, and so what what else is on your mind around, um, you know, this sort of wave two um, type scenario? Yeah, so, so, the, so the big one now is the overseas investment office. So, you know, I've got, I spent a lot of time down in Queenstown. Um, there's a, um, you know, and tourism has just stopped. And the scary thing is, is how long will it be till we can have um, Australians and, and other people come through? Well, if a, if a, if a, um, um, if a vaccine is 18 months away, and there's a bit of optimism that maybe that can be under 12 months away, but, you know, still, then it's got to be deployed at scale and you've got to prove that it works. So it's hard to imagine international travel um, that's convenient um, starting in the next 18 months or so. It's like, holy shit, that's just such a big thing to get, to, uh, get your head around. So so a whole lot of jobs just don't exist in Queenstown um, in that tourism space. And then you look back and you see then there's a whole lot of construction projects that are dependent on that tourism. So, um, you yeah, know, two or three years ago when the new government came in, um, you know, they had uh, uh, that, that very populist, a reaction of based on our equality value that you know people shouldn't be able to buy um, land here and build um, and so we kind of close the door so people can't come people can't sell their places to people overseas and part of that was was around the housing crisis but of course that made no sense because they just aren't the sort of places that you know and you know people from overseas aren't buying the sort of houses that have an impact on the housing crisis so, I mean that was that was just fake. But anyway, so now, now um, you have to ask the question, um, do we open up New Zealand for construction projects? You know, we know that we are a bolt hole and the amazing work that um, our Prime Minister is doing is even enhancing that. And you'd have to think we could get, we could sell one to 2,000 sections for five to $10 million plus construction projects. Uh, not completely sight unseen because a lot of the people that have um, been wanting to build down here have been here and they're frustrated yeah. they can't buy here. Uh, they know the locations, they can see videos, they can get online. 
I reckon we could actually, you know, be, uh, be doing projects with the architects kick off pretty quickly in the next month or so and get that going and then start, you know, we can get earthworks and all those things going. So I reckon that's a very clear way that we can create another $10 billion of construction value and getting that money in. So then it ripples through all the cafes and all the services and all those things that go through. So that's a very easy one. And that one's on David Parker. So he's the one who really pushed for us to close things down. So what I've been doing is putting very clear pressure on him to ask the question. We don't have time to wait. If you're running a construction firm and you've got, you know, payroll bills of ten to twenty thousand dollars a month, you can't wait for six months. So it's a very easy question. And I would urge anybody to email him. You know, we I talked to Mike Hoskins this morning. We, we can get him on the radio. That's an easy one. So say yes or no. If it's yes, let's go because we don't have time. I agree. Yep, yep. And and, and, and like, you know, I got I took I took a lot of shit for that Peter Thiel, um, getting Peter Thiel in here. Um and uh uh you know, because it was populist for people to say so, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll go back. Well, you may not like Peter's politics and all those things that have played out. At the time, having someone like Peter who was really interested in, in our country and the way that he could help us. I've got great friends who have um from the US who managed to buy places in Hawke's Bay be before um uh, before things closed down, they've been nothing but helpful. They they consume no services. They don't really use roads. They don't use hospitals. They don't they don't use education. They pay GST on everything. You know they they you know they buy their house. They buy their cars. They create jobs. But the connection that you get, the way that they help us with our build our businesses overseas, and they're so evangelical for New Zealand. They're bringing their friends down. Like we you know we've had so many interesting um, and connected. Um, uh, people here that we're having great conversations with, and it's nuts that, that that we don't encourage them to be here, you know. And you could go, you could go much further. We could, you know, we uh, at the moment the way the tax system works, people, you know, can't can have to be here under six months. I mean, why don't we do why don't we do a deal where we only tax we, we do like a maximum of two million dollars of tax for all of your worldwide income, so they can stay here longer. And that's just money that uh, we wouldn't see. We could compete and absolutely pull people down here. So I'm not saying that's right or wrong because you're balancing that up against our values of the of equality in the environment. But now is now is absolutely the time to have that uh, discussion because I think there are some good easy wins there, and we can get it right. And it may not be all of New Zealand. We might pick some zones like uh, the Tuki Tuki Valley around that golf course up in Auckland where a bunch of Silicon Valley people are, are building and buying there and Queenstown, obviously. Yeah, look, I, th I think the, the, there's a lot of wisdom to that. And, uh, you know, I un understand, um, you know, to, to a degree why, um, you know, government have, uh, have you know, locked down so that, um, you know, property's not, not sold offshore. But right now, look, if we if we weigh everything up, um, you know, I think it, it, it's a pretty quick... Uh, calculation to see that this has to be, uh, you know, good for New Zealand. And look, you know, the rest of the world looks to New Zealand uh, as just such an incredible uh, location, such an incredible place that's not overpopulated and crowded and, uh, you know, crazy. It, it's, you know, very much is considered a, a paradise. And, uh, you know, yeah, what, why not open the door and let a few more people in? Um, and it's got to have, it's got to play out well. I, you know, I would imagine, unless we're, uh, you know, handing over the keys to run the country to, um, you know, random people from from other parts of the world. But you know, other other than that, I'm, I'm pretty keen on that approach, Rod. Uh, make, make, makes a huge amount of sense. Um, and was is there anything else in that um, um, view that you want to delve into? I know you've you know you've really been looking into um, environmental uh, things from a New Zealand perspective and involved in a um, you know, a lot of discussions around um, you know how how we could um, you know move to you know even more. Um, um you know environmentally sort of you know friendly approaches to uh to transport to um electricity generation um what what are the things that are on your mind from that perspective rod yes again that's a pretty big uh, discussion but over you know when i finished um at zero and i had time you know spent lots of time on my on my bike thinking i've been really kind of racking my brains around what could we do that is a platform that 
we can just build on that lots of businesses can create and gives us a sustainable competitive advantage as a country. You know, what's our version of Saudi Arabian oil? And as I kind of thought about it, the answer actually came out quite quickly. It's renewable electricity. You know, we have hills and we have rain. You know, Australia doesn't have rain, doesn't have many hills either. So they can't do it. Um, and uh, parts of Europe don't have don't have hills either. And so they're doing lots of things with wind and solar. So I started pulling the string on that. And it was really interesting what I found that that um, we're sort of 80 plus percent renewables right now. And I started pulling the string on that even more, finding, well, why aren't we 100 percent? And the answers were actually super interesting. So what I found was we only store like a few months worth of water. And I was like, oh, OK, well, that's kind of crazy. Why wouldn't we store like more um, more than a season? Um, but, you know, we kind of stopped building building dams. Uh, so, um, so, so that was interesting. And then I um, started talking to the strategy groups, at some of other generators and uh, electricity retailers. And I can't remember exactly what the numbers were. I've got them written down somewhere. But um, like Fonterra is a really big user of energy for industrial heating processes. And I think the numbers were something like the, um, the price of electricity is 65 bucks per unit and the price of sort of coal and gas is 45 bucks a unit. So, well, so they are quite, quite rationally not using electricity. So it was clear then the price of electricity is, is too high. And then you go, okay, well, what, is, what makes the cost of electricity if it's just rain, you know, if it's just water? Well, it's the cost of the infrastructure and the more units you put through it, then the, the, then the unit price must come down. So, okay, well, that's interesting. So then you go, okay, well, what if we had a, had a massive amount more water? Um, like, why don't we store three or four years worth of water, which seems to be good for the environment because you can flush rivers, you can do more plant-based proteins, it's a good place to store things. And it was really clear the best battery of all is a lake. If you're doing solar, you've got to store energy somewhere, which, you know, requires a whole lot of batteries, whereas with water, you just sort of hold it up in the air behind the wall and when you want to turn it on, which you can do in about 15 minutes, you can just generate more electricity. So water is both the, ener both the energy source and it's this big potential battery. So I thought, well, that all kind of makes sense. So then I said, well, you know, being in the Hawke's Bay, we know what it's like to try to get a dam away. And um, that environment value is really, really key. So, um, so let's park the supply side that I think what we've got to do, there's not that many exciting things happening in New Zealand, certainly from a political thing. There's no real projects that we get behind. So then I started thinking about, well, technology's moved along quite a lot in the last few years. What are the projects that New Zealanders would actually want? And their thinking is if we can lay out those really exciting things, then people might say, okay, well, maybe we do sacrifice a small amount of land, and maybe it's not even a sacrifice because it's actually good having that much water. Um, but if we can not talk about just building dams, but talk about what are the cool things we could do and get that vision going, then, then you can have a mature discussion about whether we should sacrifice a small amount of land. So, so you look at tech, I mean, the obvious one is um, electric cars, and the numbers of us not importing oil for transport is really interesting. Our balance of payments flip. And as an island nation, that feels like a really good thing to do. And then I was actually listening to the um, uh, a New Zealand electric vehicle podcast driving up to Auckland one day uh, with D on that. And um, they, had a, they had a guy called Dr. Rod Badcock. And um, he's, he's down at Victoria University. And he was fascinating. Uh, perhaps you can put a link to that podcast um, in the show notes. But he was cool. talking about they've they've got a um, they've got a group down at Victoria University that's doing superconducting electric motors, which they're using right now as stabilizers on Japanese bullet trains. But they're part of a global consortium working with NASA, dealing with electric aviation. And um, they've just passed this, and this was probably eighteen months ago. Passed this threshold of fifteen kilowatts of power per kilo of engine mass was where engine electric engines start getting viable for flight. So it's quite realistic in the next sort of 10 years that he was saying that we'll be able to fly 737-sized aircraft using electricity. And that just blew my mind. If you think about that from a New Zealand point of view, where 100% of our domestic aviation market is very short haul, you know, we can't fly more than two hours or you're somewhere in the ocean. So, so if you were doing electric 
flying in Finland, you might have a cool electric plane sitting next to an A380 that's going to fly for, you know, 15 hours. What we can do is say, look, we're going to completely change our domestic aviation fleet. And, um, and then you put that up for uh, New Zealanders and uh, anyone who's environmentally friendly, they go, heck yeah, you know, we would love to be able to fly really cheap because we've made electricity cheap. And also we'd love to fly with no carbon guilt and see our country. So if we say, look, our goal, our vision is to have 100% um, domestic aviation uh, that's carbon free, everyone goes, yeah. Um, and there's so many other examples, think about Auckland public transport, maybe you need um, some light rail. I doubt it because, you know, that just feels to me that sort of old technology. And we're seeing, you know, China's putting a phenomenal amount of electric buses. I want to say like 50,000 electric buses on per month, some number we can't understand. And, you know, when I got to Auckland and you drive up to Albany, you see those park and rides, which are overflowing with cars at 9.30 in the morning. You know, they're parked up grass verges, all of those sort of things. That's nuts that you even drive your car to park somewhere to go and catch a bus. Um, wouldn't it be cool if we had these small electric buses, which are super cheap because there's not many moving parts and eventually they won't need drivers, so they're super cheap. And every Auckland uh, commuter has a mobile phone, so we know what they did last week. We know what they where they need to be next week. We know what the weather's going to be. So imagine if we were um, importing uh, cheap electric buses and we became really good at writing the fleet management software that knew where everybody needed to go and then uh, as new buses or, or whatever came onto the network, it just kept reconfiguring every day so we knew where, where things needed to be. So you get a ping on your mobile phone the night before saying, hey, your personalised bus is coming through Milford um, at, at, at five past eight. You, you're going to arrive at work at 8.26. Um, so you walk out, you've got a whole lot of buses, small little buses with you know eight to ten people that are just going slowly 25 k's down the streets with no driver. You jump on that. As you get closer to the motorway, they start chaining together. So there's a few of them. Just before the bridge, they pull over. You get a message on your phone, jump from carriage B to carriage F. Just walk down for 30 seconds. Everyone chains over the um, over the bridge, and then you flock off over to Westmere or somewhere. You know, that's all very possible now. And I've been chatting to the um, uh, the mayor of Wellington as one of these projects. Why don't we make Wellington the right-hand drive test lab? So I was chatting to the CEO of Zooks yesterday. Uh, there's another German company I was, um, I'm talking to uh, tomorrow. And, you know, we've already proven um, uh, with Kitty Hawk, the autonomous flying taxi stuff that's happening in the middle of South Island that the government's got behind and then New Zealand's got behind. Well, why don't we get behind um, electric buses and smart networks? So, you know, these are the things we can do as, as connected business people is reach out to the CEOs of, of those companies and um, uh, say, look, we, we have thin layers of government. We can uh, work with you as long as it's all safe. We can even use our New Zealand super fund money to um, uh, bring local investment to fund those local trials. So you can keep going with your business plan. We'll fund that locally because we're going to get a share in it and we get benefit from it and make those things happen. So those are the sort of awesome projects that are you know just really really fun that we can do here in new zealand yeah look i, I think uh, that that makes a lot of sense too because as a as a smaller nation um we can get rolling and actually get those things into play you know reasonably easily compared to probably a lot of um a lot of other markets and look a, as you say with the um uh yeah with whisk and and the autonomous air taxi testing that's been going on um in the south island you know new zealand seems to be uh, a great place with that right sort of balance from a, a regulatory and a, and a safety uh perspective um there, there, there's so much incredible uh you know talent here that we can we can tap um, you know, zero is, is a testament to that. Uh, Rocket Lab is a is a testament to that. Um, there's so much that can be done here, and um, you know, if we if we just sit back, then these things don't happen. So um, yeah, some some of it has to uh, has to be facilitated at a at a government and and a local government level. Um, but of course, a big chunk of it is is down to um, you know those those in business who have got the uh, the vision to um, you know to get in and 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 get these things rolling. Um, and to set up those partnerships, and I, you know, I see recently that um, you know there, there, there's a lot of work going on um, 
in terms of moving to uh, electric ferries. Um, and so, you know, that, that stuff's happening in Auckland. Um, but look, th this could be happening in the air. It can really be happening with, uh, with, with public transport. And I really like that, that thought of, um, you know, linking together, um, you know, small, you know, potentially autonomous, uh, you know, vehicles with, with an app um, to really solve some of those transport problems, some of those reasons that people don't use public transport today um, because it takes them twice as long to get to their destination as it does if they, you know, jump in their, their own vehicle and, uh, you know, and, and clog up the roads. And, and technology is absolutely, um, you know, the, the, the key that can uh, join these dots up um, and solve those problems. So um, that's great. Now, Rod, um, you know, your, your experience with Xero means, uh, you know, you've, you've seen uh, the insides and, and outsides and, you know, so many aspects of uh, small business. And, of course, uh, you know, New Zealand as, as a nation, we, we have our big firms, um, you know, like the Zeros, which everyone knows about. Um, but we also have, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of small businesses. And, of course, uh, now, now is a time when a lot of those are in, in jeopardy, uh, you know, particularly those involved in, in the areas of, of you know, of tourism, um, th those that are uh, involved in um, um, entertainment, food and, and beverages and, and so on. Um, but there are opportunities, right? What, what, are, you, um, what are you seeing out there where you, where you think um, or approaches that you think are um, useful for small businesses to be, uh, you know, taking at the moment in terms of, um, you know, preparing themselves for, for the future? Yes, yeah, so I'm seeing lots of really seeing lots of really interesting things, and it's so impressed when you see how fast some of these businesses have moved. So, I mean, the good thing about I mean, some there there is some positives around this sort of month of lockdown, and I think it's caused everybody to be very introspective. I know some people are really lonely and they're on their own, and it's really tough. But for a lot of people who are just running so fast, being able to have some quality, you know, people are actually saying they're having quality times with uh, their families. Um, you know, this is a this is a special time, and it's a quality time to think as well. Um, and so I know that you know I've, it's just slowed me down, and now I've had time to think strategically. So I'm pretty clear about you know what I want to do personally over the next four or five years, and I hope that other people think that, and I think business people are thinking that as well. Um, what's been interesting being in Hawke's Bay is there's a lot of food producers who um, were producing food which people need, but they weren't part of uh, the supermarket ch channel. So it's been fascinating watching them pivot very quickly and putting direct-to-consumer um, uh, sites um, uh, sites out there quickly connecting at a Shopify, um, not you know not building complex sites where you can pick I'll take a take a carrot and a beetroot and put it all into a box, just saying look here's small vegetables, large vegetables box. Um, which which one do you want? So I brought some brought a box of veggies from Reed Produce the other day. Um, I've been um, getting vegan bread mix from, oh my goodness, bread and Hastings. Uh, been getting avocados to go on that bread and some lemons uh, from Twisted Citrus. There's been so many um, cool food producers, you know, which aren't that tech, that are using this massive investment that the industry's made and really easy to use applications and, and, and back end software and connecting to the courier companies to make all of that work. So I think everyone's got to think about how they digitise their business. The really um, big thing going on, because there are businesses that just can't exist at the moment, is the government's put a lot of work into, um, you know, into aid. So what we've been doing as part of Zero, what the team there's been doing is, um, you know, trying to unpack all of that, make it really easy to understand, make software changes so we can manage all of that. And then the next wave will be the how do we get um, assistance from the banking industry out to small businesses as well and manage all of that. And, you know, and again, this is a shock for the banks and that aren't, you know, best at, aren't fast at moving at the best of times, but they're working incredibly hard to interpret what the rules are because banks are very motivated to not have businesses fall over because then their mortgage book is at risk, right? So they're incredibly incentivized to get the right amount of money to um, to small businesses. And again, that's a, that's a big uh, collaboration and in the in the US as I said 
almost the central government just can't do it. That's what that's what the evidence shows. So a lot of the big global companies are now working uh, to try to um, you, you know get those things done because you can't take you know days matter in the in the sort of situation. So there's a lot of good things to do, but I think everyone now has had like a month of working digitally. And remember, some businesses are absolutely cranking now because they can easily work from home. And I think for those businesses, if they can employ, take job, create jobs, show others, um, that that's that's definitely important. Yeah, that's uh, that that's good, right? Yeah, and look, I'm I'm um, I'm certainly with you on this the um, the idea of. Um, you know, I guess, you know, di digitizing our businesses more and, and transformation. And look, I think uh, in, in New Zealand where, you know, Zero now has a has a pretty massive market share, the, the, the competition of, um, you know, certainly modernized their, uh, their, their offerings too. I think, you know, we take for granted a, um, a level of um, digitization and, and, and automation, a, you know, a much more efficient way um, of handling uh, our accounting, you know, look back to those old days, there was sort of manual processes to pull through bank transactions um, each, each day. And, uh, you know, that, that that's so heavily automated now. Um, and the way in which, you know, our various apps and things can, uh, you know, can tie together is, is fantastic. But I think there, there are so many more of those opportunities. And yeah, we're and, we, and like we're challenging our team in turn, I'm saying to them all the time. So we've been working on e-invoicing for a long time, right? Like mm. having to wait to get paid on the 20th of the month makes no sense. Effectively, some businesses are funding bigger businesses on the chain. You know, the way they're, you know, trying to push the construction industry, but the construction industry is terrible for having larger entities funding, uh, being funded basically on a whole bunch of smaller companies. So, you know, things like, and this is the discussions we're having of the government now, let's absolutely uh, push e-invoicing hard and then we can change the culture. So you pay on invoice if the if you get an invoice and you've done the work and and the 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 invoice data comes into your system uh, and then you can approve it straight away why wouldn't the money move straight away and just speed up the velocity of money within the economy and that's going to be um, really important so you know I've been challenging our teams on that um, to ha how can we speed all of this up and this is where we can start collaborate with you know there is a an inherent uh, public private um, uh, collaboration going on you know we pushed online GST you know pushing e-invoicing really hard another thing that's really interesting is you know like we, we we've kind of relaxed and been a small brother to um, uh, to, to Australia a really small brother to, to the US but we, we're kind of unique in that um, you know we've seen the world move more towards Asia we have a free trade agreement with Asia and we see that the the values that we have, the way that we operate, are, are actually quite different to some of these other markets. And dare I say it, the markets that aren't burdened by uh, democracies. And um, you know what's interesting is seeing this kind of second internet start in um, uh, in China. And what they've done is they've pretty much mandated that every business is on uh, WeChat, not just the business, but their bank account numbers. So effectively, there's a directory of every business. There's an authoritative place where everybody is. And once you're connected, everyone's, tr everyone's trusted because they know who they are from an identification point of view. I'm sure there's a whole lot of bad surveillance stuff that's going, but it does accelerate commerce. So some of the interesting things we can do, we can do it in a much more open way with privacy, without government surveillance. But you know, having a real push to why don't we have every New Zealand business in a business directory and again, it, it, it would be open. So, you know, we would be able to use it. Maya would be able to use it. SAP would be able to use it. But we have a goal of let's get every New Zealand business uh, with, a, with an electronic address all verified, perhaps every consumer as well, so that you can go and transact faster. And these are things where the kind of North Korean way would be a bit more active and the New Zealand way would be incredibly passive. But somehow kind of connecting the dots on those things and doing it in the right way with clear values, with privacy and security is really interesting. And I think that's, you know, why I've always pushed for having a CTO and, you know, we've got a new digital council out there. Those are the kind of interesting projects that might take a few years, but they really move things on. And I think the challenge is creating the right forum to have those discussions and then demanding more of the government to actually move on these things. If you've done the work, make the decision. Don't just keep punting it and punting it like we saw with PayWave.
Sorry, I just had to have a little rant there. Yeah, no, no. Actually, look, there, there's some, um, yeah, there's some great, great things in, um, in what you raised there. And look, I, I'd be really interested, um, you know, how much difference would it make in New Zealand if, and look, I, I, I'll put the blame, um, you know, more squarely to our bigger businesses. But I know it's just, it's not just the bigger, the, the bigger organisations. Um, but yeah, often there seems to be so much red tape just to getting a bill paid when uh, work has been carried out, and the impact that it actually has on small, um, you know, small entities is, is massive. And I mean, you would know that that through zero better than uh, better than anybody. But you know, cash flow is the life blood of a uh, small business. And when you get, um, you know, an entity that that mucks you around, um, you know, even just waiting to twentieth of the following month for a payment, as is, as is still so common, um, you know, in a lot of parts of the New Zealand economy. Um, can be really choking to a small business, and then and then there are those that will will string it out, um, you know, e even more, and um, you know, use other businesses basically as a as a funding line for their own um, entity. It's it's incredibly um, you know challenging to our to our economy. So yeah, I'm I'm um, I'm pretty keen on that approach. When uh, you know when when an invoice gets uh, fed out electronically, you should tick it off, and it and it should should get paid. So um, that that's great. Um, now, any other um, you know thoughts that you can you can share, Rod, in terms of um, you know how how our um, organisations should go about um, you know rethinking what they do because you know there is that need right now to be to be stepping back a little bit. Um, you know, I think mo most smaller businesses are going to have um, you know pain either at a small scale or a large scale. Um, and in some of those cases, you know, the businesses may not survive. So we've got people that need to step back and rethink. Well, you know, what should my next uh, next business be? Um, other ones need to be looking and um, you know and figuring out. Well, you know, now we've you know we've kind of pressing reset on things a bit. Um, you know, what what should that future um, picture look like? Um, I mean, you've done through through zero. Um, you know, you've managed to think incredibly strategically. Um, you know, I th I think I recall you saying um, at some point. You know, you're you're usually looking sort of you know half a decade to you know to a decade out on things. Um, you know, of course, there, there there's there's going to be a need to sort of balance that, right? Um, so, any suggestions and 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 advice that you can offer to our New Zealand, um, you know, business owners and um, and and those in, involved in, um, in in leadership and, and and advising others across the country. Yeah, so you know, from from an individual thing, what what do you do next? How do you tweak your business? So, um, it's survival mode right now, and we're gonna you know be in an environment where we're kind of on our own for about eighteen months. And so obviously we have to do quick work to make sure that we work in this new environment, which will probably mean uh, some digitization. But what's also happening is the rest of the world now is being trained to operate through Zoom or Hangouts or Skype, um, uh, whatever your poison is. Um, but so that means it doesn't matter. Location doesn't matter. And what's interesting about New Zealand, and even more so because we are probably going to be freeing up faster than everyone else and the rest of the world is going to want to be here, and this is the thing that blew me away when I started raising money in the States, is, is a lot of people around the world have a fantasy relationship with here. They imagine being in New Zealand, they want to come down here, and they love connecting with Kiwis. So what, what's happening over, what's happened over the last month is a lot of people now have worked out actually how you work with Zoom, how you manage having kids at home, how you, it doesn't matter when you do calls, if you're selling overseas, you know, you don't have to do uh, calls between nine and five, you can actually do, you know, calls at seven or eight at night or catch the UK first thing in the morning. So I think what's interesting now is, you know, we've always talked about, um, you know, can you export services? And a lot of companies have done that um, just because they saw the opportunity, they saw how much cheaper we were. Um, but now I think we've all been demonstrated that it's possible to use the tools. And in all of the other markets, they're going to have, um, well, they do have, tight, well, they're going to have longer lockdown and they're not going to be traveling for even a longer period. So, um, 
you know, if they're buying from their, you know, from from people in their own country or getting great service that's cost effective from uh, providers in New Zealand, that's really interesting. So this is, um, you know, some of the silver lining of this is we're all being trained in that we can sell anywhere in the world now. So building businesses, you know, where you move from a, you know, a market size of four million people to hundreds of millions is super exciting. And it's, um, you know, the way that you get out there now, you don't have to go and spend a whole lot of money in marketing. You can use social media to get into those communities. You can just dial into, you know, some sort of supply community or whatever your special interest is with any sort of marketing. You can do virtual conferences. You can you can educate, get a Harvard degree, I'm sure, online and, um, and just be part of those global uh, communities. And you know, imagine that how cool it is to be able to live in New Zealand. You know, look out and see the sun and go for a mountain bike, and then also being able to sell right through the day and into the night, just just from your own uh, computer. So, you know, I think the, those opportunities have always been clear. Now they're super clear. Love it, love it. Thanks, Rod. Yeah, and and look, we we we're, um, we're on the same page on that stuff, and and we're going to keep these conversations going in terms of you know what what can we do. Um, you know, there, there, there's a um, you know, there's a mindset um, aspect to it. We've got to be uh, we've got to be looking out for those opportunities, um, but we've also got to draw and learn from others, and and that's why I really appreciate you sh you know sharing um, you know some of your time with us today, um, because you know you, you've got so much real world experience. So you're not just talking uh, you know theory here. This is uh, this is the real deal. Um, now I know we've um, we've we've burnt through a chunk of your time, Rod. Um, were there any other bits and pieces that um, that you wanted to chat about before we um, you know before we finish up? No, I think I've done. That's been very uh, cathartic. Thank you for allowing me to to vent. This was like a, a psychiatrist session. So thank you. <laughs> uh, always uh, always great to catch up, uh, Rod. And look for those that. Um, um, that haven't heard Rod on um, on previous episodes, then um, you know take take a look at our uh, back catalogue there of the New Zealand Business Podcast. Uh, Rod's also been on uh, the Electric Vehicle uh, pod podcast uh, that, that he, he mentioned that show earlier. The the New Zealand Tech Podcast, and of course we've got a you know a, a bunch of shows there on our um, you know little independent uh, podcasts NZ uh, network. So. Um, you know, well worth having a look in there. Uh, the New Zealand Everyday Investor, probably of interest uh, to people at the moment. And then um, the the new show that we have from uh, Vincent Heringer, of course, the founder of Unlimited Magazine and Idealog, um, who is who is doing this climate business. So um, that's another one well well worth um, looking out for. So um, hey, thanks everybody for, um, for for joining us on the show. And uh, yeah, thanks again, uh, Rod, for. Uh, um, for taking the time and um, we'll, we'll catch everybody um, um, either on uh, one of our audio episodes uh, or on one of our li live streams as uh, you know we continue these chats um, during this period and uh, look wishing all, all the best uh, uh, to everyone at this time.